It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, Founder and Managing Director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. My guest today is CEO Ronald Schroeder. Ron is the chief executive officer and chairman of the board of directors of Frontier Technology, which is headquartered in Dayton, Ohio. He has over 35 years of diversified technical and management experience in the Department of Defense, commercial, and other federal markets. The majority of his time has been working for two small businesses, each having grown significantly during his tenure. Ron was named a finalist for Dayton's Executive of the Year Award and is a member of the Governor's Ohio Aerospace and Aviation Technology Committee and also a fellow member of C-12. Ron Schroeder, welcome into the corner office. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to have you here, Ron, and a uh, wonderful connection. As I mentioned in the bio, we're both members of C12, a fantastic organization that I'm rather new to, and we'll certainly touch on that as we go, but it's great to talk to another uh, leader who obviously also has a faith-based direction. But let's start a little bit about your early years. Wanted to know a little bit about where you grew up and you know what your early family life was like. It's typically a, a little bit different, I think, than most stories. I, I was blessed to be grow up here in Dayton, yeah. a suburb called Kettering, and my mom and dad ran a foster home. And oh, wow. so cool. while I was growing up, we had lots of brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah, we did. And there was there was um, four of us as far as uh, you know, belong to mom and dad and yeah. siblings. But during the time I was up to fifteen, I think we had about one hundred and six foster wow. kids through the Fascinating. house. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Were they from a local community, Ron, or where did they come from? They were. This was in uh, the 60s and 70s. And a lot of them were being looked at for adoption and other things along those lines. So a lot of newborns in the house. Um, On any given day, we probably have 10 people in the home, which my kids still marvel at since there was only (laughs) one bathroom. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, what a tremendous act of service. Was that something that they, you know, were involved with even before you came along and or something they developed later in life? How did they get into the the foster service uh, area? Yeah, no, I was third of the four kids and they had started it kind of I think just before I was born, a couple of years before, and it really was just an act of service, yeah, trying fantastic. to do the right thing and help people out, which was a great way for our siblings, my siblings to grow up because you quickly learned it wasn't about you. Yeah, fantastic. And, and how long did the longest foster child stay? Was it usually just a few weeks or months or did some of them hang around for years? A lot of the infants the newborns coming out of the hospital to our house would typically be there maybe four months or so, but we had some toddlers that would go on for years. So it was a good thing. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, what a wonderful act of service. So tell me a little bit about your parents, their background and uh, your, your immediate siblings, and then maybe some of your foster siblings that, you know, maybe inspired you or things that about them that, you know, really were encouraging as you were growing up in those early years. It kind of starts with mom. I mean, she uh-huh. she was the dominant force of that foster home and really uh-huh. kind of put the foundation in our hearts about loving mm-hmm. your neighbor. And then dad, <clears throat> it was amazing because really an inspiration in that he was a utility worker for the power company. So we jokingly talked about he climbed poles for a living, but um, it was amazing (laughs) when he'd come back into that house. He worked uh, for decades. He worked uh, rotating shifts every month. So first, second, and third shift. So he would come into the house at different hours and Uh focus on us as the kids, but also be there for the 
foster home. I mean, in in our case, he was actually uh, called out as father of the year in Dayton at oh. one point just because of the combination. So really somebody to admire. And then being third of four, I had an older sister who was incredibly good at everything she did. Mm. An older brother who academically set high standards for the rest of us. <laughs> tough, tough foots to follow. Right. right. And then a, a younger brother who went on to kind of inspire us a little bit later in life, a, a doctor and other things. So it was a great combination of, I'll call it the six of us, plus all the invited guests. Wow. Well, I think your mom defines what stay-at-home motherhood is all about. Yeah, right? there you go. Right. <laughs> not not many goodness. could do that today. Absolutely. And, um, you know, was it a Christian home? Was this something that was important and from, from a you know, spiritual belief standpoint? It really was, but it probably in a unique path. I'm sure we all have unique paths to go through, but uh, literally dad would come into the room every night. He wasn't on third shift. And as kids, he would kind of call us out individually over the foster kids. And literally, if he was home every night, we would sing our father just between him and us type yeah. stuff and then kind of do now I lay me down to sleep type aspects. So right. Christianity was a part of every day he was there. But ironically, um, we probably weren't actually in the physical church as much as most because it would be very hard. Some night days he would be working at that time and sure. other days it was a little bit of a challenge to get, you know, 10 people. Getting in. 10 kids to church. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. that, right. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And and when did you come to Christ, Ron? Um, realistically, I, that uh, that singing every day that, yeah. <laughs> or, or most days, uh, the yearning was always there. It, I really took it to a different level as I started to become an adult and part just because of my my wife um, kind of synced up with my passions and we took it to a different level. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So again, not so much church life growing up, but really in the home, him being a part of the family, right? right. Uh, so to speak, particularly with the nighttime songs and so forth. Did, did you, uh, you know, go to church through, through middle school and high school? Did you, you know, once you were able to get yourself around or did that come later in life? That, that literally came yeah. as a young adult. I, right, we, right. I mean, we would go at different times when we were growing up. It just sure. wasn't as weekly sure. as it would like to be. I think my dad's right. favorite service was when one of the pastors said, uh, you know, you can be a strong Christian, even if you're yeah. not here every yeah. Sunday. And right. my dad would go, see, I, I told you. <laughs> well, out of necessity. But, you know, that is really a good, good example because it is about living it every day, isn't it? Right. It really is. What do you do every day to kind of stay close to the Lord? You know, I, I have different patterns. I, mm -hmm. I uh, work 40 minutes from home. And so I, I will um, oftentimes do audio Bibles through Audible. Yeah. It takes me about nine months to get through the, yeah. the book every year um, or every other year as we go through it. And just other aspects with Bible study mixed in from a family life to make sure I'm connected. And certainly, right. as you know, C12 yeah. gives you a lot of uh, ways that other people you really respect kind of hold you accountable to make sure you're doing the right thing. Great content and great connections. And it really those, is. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. For those of you who don't know, C12 is a pure advisory group of CEOs, both owners, as well as folks that run businesses uh, across the world. I think we've got close to 2,500 members now, Ron, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think 100, it is. 150 groups. And uh, it's been an amazing experience for both of us. Well, the focus, uh, obviously, at some level is the Christian side of it. It really right. does help on the business side as well. It really does. No question. It's been very inspirational for me, too. But back to your childhood. T tell me a little bit about maybe some of the other inspirations or, or people that maybe had an influence on you. You know, were there coaches or, you know, teachers in particular that might have had an impact on you that you remember from way back then? It probably starts with dad as the predominant mm -hmm. force. But he had a, a younger brother. Actually, I had two younger brothers, and one of them was an, an eye doctor who uh, was single, and he had his own airplane, his own speedboat, his own motorcycle, wow. and he, he without <laughs> kids, he liked to hang out with us. His younger, uh, the other brother who I'm named after was uh, very inspirational on just his relationship with his wife and, and kind of setting it up at a different level. Nice. We were blessed. For instance, um, my uncle with the airplane lived in the same city that Neil Armstrong did. And it just oh. so happened that Neil was shared the same hangar. So as kids, we would get to go fly in the oh plane, gosh. but only after we had a chance to talk to Neil about 
Uh, we never talked to him about his major activity. He, that was something he was a little bit laid back on. But we would sit there and talk to him about the weather and the airplanes and the twin engine airplane versus oh, a set. Fabulous. A lot of those guys really inspired me. If you, yeah. Neil went to Purdue engineering, I did. Uh, Dad was electrical. I, um, there was a lot of inspiration then. And then later in life, even my wife's dad is a an amazing man who kind of set a tone for an Eagle Scout early on in life and mm. a Bible study teacher for decades that, that really do inspire you on a day-by-day basis. Well, were you a good student in school, Ron? I was. Uh, yeah, the the yeah. first two set a high bar and I tried to uh, <laughs> tried to exceed it. I would tease him that I, I think I did, but we'll see. Right, right. Terrific. And, and what are kinds of activities outside of class? Were you involved in sports, music, theater, anything like that? You know, I did a little bit of all of it. I did a lot of water skiing, racquetball, and, um, basketball, and other things. So I, I was kind of a, a catch-all. In today's environment, parents probably would transport you to your favorite athletic facility all year long right. and get you ready. Right. With 10 people in the house, you really weren't going to be transported anywhere. <laughs> the uh, bike was your form of transportation. That's exactly right. But, <laughs> but you learned to, to play a lot of different sports, golf and others, initially in the yard. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then yeah. as you got to be a kind of a mid-level teenager, other people would kind of invite you out. So sure. I, uh, my wife jokes, I, I, I play a lot of them. Were there any entrepreneurial things you were involved with when you were younger, you know, the ubiquitous paper route or selling Christmas cards or those types of things, lemonade stands? <laughs> I grew up knowing that from a blue collar background or whatever, college was an objective, yeah, but yeah. the economics of it were always going to be a challenge. So I think I won't say entrepreneurial in that I started it from scratch, right. but I knew I had to work early on. So from 13 to 14, I was always working jobs. And some of those would lead me to the owners who would use me on the side for other activities. I know like I worked in a nursery for landscaping and then the owner would use me for physical labor to undo trucks and stuff along those lines, which always, you know, kept that entrepreneurial spirit burning a little bit of, can I do more? Any lessons from those earlier part-time jobs while you were in school? I will just say, um, number one, working hard um, showed up. A lot of people would give you a f- positive feedback. Mm-hmm. And then number two, economically, you could see the savings account generally drifting forward. Which That'd be made a motivator. Col- right? Yeah, which made college <laughs> a little bit more and more realistic as we went farther. Did older brother and sister go to college? They did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mom and dad did not. um, But the first two did. They both went to a a business school in Ohio called Miami University. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Jokingly had me lined up to to head that direction as well. Yeah. But you decided on Purdue. So tell us a little bit about kind of how that uh, how that trajectory took place, given that Miami uh, was perhaps uh, maybe the, uh, the the mold in which you were meant to follow. You know, these kind of podcasts bring out the embarrassing stories, but I think everybody <laughs> was lined up for me to go to Miami and a, a good friend of mine said, Hey, your grades are so good. You want to go to campus, stay with us. It won't matter that you missed high school. And I said, sure. Where are you going? And he said, Purdue. Uh-huh. And I kind of remembered Neil went there and I was thinking of biomedical engineering. So I casually drove up with him that day and, and came back to my dad and said, oh, yeah, I know I've changed my mind. And my dad, you know, he has my heart from day one. But I remember the conversation being, Dad, I've decided I'm going to go to Purdue. And his comment that day was, isn't that in Iowa somewhere? <laughs> oh, gosh, I love it. So, yeah. uh, but no resistance. No, he, yeah. you know, he, uh, again, my, my role model, he, yeah. he inspired you and wanted you to do the best. So and he made it clear man. every day. Be your own man. So, so you went into engineering and, and you'd mentioned Neil Armstrong and some of the other pilots inspired you. Did you study engineering straight off the bat? I did, but that was not my uh, intent, as odd as that sounds. I I grew up with all those kids, and I just wanted to be near kids the rest of my life, I thought. So I decided that I was going to go biomedical engineering because that would be the best way to get into med school. Okay. And so a pre-med degree, I didn't think would be competitive enough. And so I started off at Purdue and biomedical engineering, which was kind of new. So it was actually part of the electrical engineering school, which 
combined the Neil thing as well, right. a little bit of dad, right. et cetera. And then as I worked my way through the first couple of years, the great insight of wanting to be a pediatrician quickly fell apart mm. because I, to build my resume, I, I went off and became an EMT for ambulances. Oh, okay. And after getting involved, I could I could go through the activities that were needed on those given days. But when I'd go home at night, I really couldn't sleep because I'd keep wondering what happened to him. Mm. And so it yeah, was very close to it. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and uh, you know, I saw a couple of kids in ERs and other things that oh, really it's devastating impacted me in a way that I realized that I didn't think I had the emotional fortitude right. to do that every day. Yeah, you know, that's so uh, great that you say that. My daughter is pre-med and uh, I can't stand the sight of blood. So, you know, go go figure. And being in the hospital and I've had the unfortunate uh, ha- happen to be in there, not just by, by myself, but with others. But she has got that balance. You know, she's got a heart of gold, but she, you know, she's done a lot of shadowing and so forth. And, you know, I think you probably made a very good choice that you can't be too close to them. I, I think that would be something would be so difficult because uh, my heart would go out. Every time I would see someone sick, I, I, I know I was told early on when I was going through some rough spots in my life, you know, if you're depressed, go to a children's hospital. It'll cheer you up yeah. <laughs> you know, and figure out how well you did. So you, you said you were a, uh, an AMP. Uh, was that just part time work during college then or is that? It something was. You did? I, OK, I did that a little bit more as a resume builder. I, ironically, not the typical guy in college. I, I needed money. So I worked my way through college in a daycare center. Okay. All right. Well, the, the, back to your roots. Yeah, huh? back to the roots. It made you feel good. You know I mean? Yeah, fantastic. And any scholarships involved in that at all? Purdue, I know, is not an inexpensive school. I had a few kind yeah. of academic from high school. and Right. But, you know, because this was back thousand in the... dollars here or there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the 70s or 80s, it was a little more cost effective than maybe some of the schools are today. <laughs> yes, although I think yeah. Purdue is kept their um, costs the same for about yeah. a decade. So oh, it's a great. good school. Yeah. They, in fact, they got a very good president. I was reading or mm-hmm. listening they to do. a podcast recently about a really different tack that he's taken where I think actually tuition costs have gone down and they've been, you know, working on a, a way in which to really make college affordable. And it was, it was very impressive. Yeah. Former there, governor of the state. Yeah, that's right. Went, right. I think right. he was being told to run for president and he chose to, the Purdue path. Yeah. Instead. Yeah, yeah. So it's that's been good for the school. It's a great, great history there. Yeah. So, so what was the first job out of college? When I was the last couple of years at school, when I realized I wasn't going to go into pre-med working in the Dayton area, Dayton is blessed to have Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, an Air Force community of engineering and analysis that supports all the acquisitions the Air Force does. And so during college in the summers, I worked in the engineering part of that area, the research lab for a couple of years. And when I interviewed out of Purdue, some of the large defense contractors showed interest. So I actually left Purdue and went to work for Northrop, um, working on electronic warfare systems in Chicago, Illinois. Wow, wow. So you've pretty much stayed in the same sector your whole career. I have, yeah, yeah really yeah. have. Fabulous. And uh, did you get, uh, you know, early management responsibilities? How did Northrop kind of develop you uh, coming out of school? Well, I spent about three and a half years there, and mm-hmm. it was uh, a great thing. There's a part of engineering called systems engineering, which is kind of where you get to decompose the requirements to the hardware and the software engineers. And so initially, and um, I was a little bit different than the new grads because I had some experience where others were just coming out of school. So I got now, into were you that. electrical or mechanical? What was your engineering? I was electrical. electrical. Yeah. Okay, got yeah. Right. When I biomedical was part of the electrical school. Got so it, right, instead right, of switching, right. I just stayed in it, realized dad and other things. And so electronic warfare is I, I joke with my kids and my wife. It's the fuzz buster on your dash, um, <laughs> except it's for, uh, you know, fighter aircraft. But right. I didn't really have a lot of people reporting to me, but I had a lot of communication requirements to task other people in hardware and software engineering as to what they needed to do to make the system come together as one. And so Uh it was a a good experience. And quickly they started using me with the clients, the actual military Air Force members or whatever, as far as requirements analysis. I had a great experience there, but I do remember them kind of saying um, as they talk to me a little bit about career and other things. 
that number one, I think they thought of me as a little bit different than the average engineer because mm. unfortunately engineers have a stereotype of um, not being great communicators. Right, right. Book smart, low, low EQ. Mm. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so I think the reason they put mm. me in front of clients at a relatively youthful age is I was um, comfortable in that setting. I had come from that setting. So it was very easy. And then number two, as they uh, started to talk about career progression, um, the HR system, uh, well, I call it the behemoth culture, said, <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't checked this gate or he hasn't got mm. the advanced degree or other things. So I, I just remember, hey, wait a minute, why is it about the degree? Why isn't it about the responsibility and what you're capable of doing? Do you remember the first time you started managing people? I, I guess that was probably after Northrop then, correct? Yeah. So what happened is um, my wife and I met through a, an odd sequence of events. And after being at Northrop for three and a half years, she was um, in New Orleans. She was a mm -hmm. Purdue grad that we were together on campus, but never met officially oh, in the same room, et cetera. Yeah. But oh, she was at, also engineering? No, she was yeah. actually restaurant hotel management okay. at Purdue. So she mm -hmm. was working at the Hyatt in the New Orleans when we uh, accidentally met through friends. and. When we decided uh, a year and a half later to get married, um, we were looking at, did she want to come to uh, Chicago or did I want to go to New Orleans? And we decided to start the marriage off compromise wise. And uh, we moved to Cincinnati. Right. OK. And she started um, there and and uh, she questions me. My my father-in-law, great man, had worked for GE for decades. Oh, and sure. just such a great life. And I think I had an offer from GE at the time in Cincinnati. So she assumed that I would uh, take that role and move to town. And instead, I, I decided I, I can remember that Northrop interaction of, um, you know, I'll, I'll call it the big corporate rules and just decided I wanted to try something entrepreneurial. So oh. I went with I, I instead of living in Cincinnati, working in Cincinnati, I drove up to Dayton with a, a kind of a small startup firm yeah, that was right. focused on electronic warfare at the time. Right. And right. as that grew, there became my first, you know, management responsibilities. And I sure. always joke that the way I learned it is I was supporting the Air Force on electronic warfare program. They liked what we were doing and asked for more. And uh, this dates me quite a bit because I had to go out to the newspaper, run an ad. <laughs> <laughs> To find the people you needed. <laughs> to find the people I needed. I had to do all the interviews and all that sure. stuff. And I went through that process, which was quite different for the, you know, then your engineering training. And when Absolutely. the Air Force came back and said, hey, we want a third, I looked at the guy I'd hired and said, you know, that whole process that I went through to find you, I wasn't very good at that. So <laughs> I'm going to delegate to you that you have all that responsibility going forward ah, and literally smart. kind of the beginning of management 101, I guess right. I'll call it. So your, your wife, what's her name? Susan. Susan's uh, dad must've worked for GE aircraft, right? Cause I think they've got a big manufacturing facility in Cincinnati. They do in Cincinnati, yeah. but she grew up in Fort Wayne. Oh, so she did. He, okay. Yeah. Got it, got so it. she, he uh, actually was involved with GE motors. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. cool. And what year did you move to Cincinnati? 1980, uh, let me see, 85. 85. Okay. Yeah. Well, we would have overlapped there. I was there from 86 to 89 with Procter & Gamble. Oh, my, my early goodness. Days. Yeah. So, yeah. We lived up in Mount Lookout on Salisbury Drive, if you know that area, right above Zips Burgers, if you remember I Zips. I do. I, I, lived on, <laughs> I lived in Mount Lookout on oh. El Ellison. Oh, I know where Ellison is. Gosh, right we across, were a couple of blocks away from each other. Yeah. Right across from the church. Yeah. So. Right. If you, you know where Salisbury is, I think it's maybe, yeah. yeah, just just a little bit up there, a little cul-de-sac. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. We probably little, ran into each other at the Kroger or something. Right, department. I was a little too addicted to Zips. Those were pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably where we ran into each other. Right. That was a great location. I love that Mount Lookout neighborhood. That's awesome. And then you moved up to Dayton then subsequently, is that correct? I did not. Um, okay. If you know the Cincinnati area, Susan right. was driving, before we had the kids, Susan was driving to the Hyatt in downtown on the river, and I okay. was up in Dayton. So after we left Mount Lookout, we went to the northern side of Cincinnati, an Just area closer. Yeah. yeah, called um, Beckett Ridge, Westchester area. Sure, if you're know familiar. Is. Yeah, awesome. Cool. And um, tell us a little bit about some of those early management lessons. You know, you obviously uh, did some early delegation. That makes sense. Um, you know, what were some of the best or maybe even the worst lessons that you had from previous bosses? You know, I know in my old life, particularly at Proctor in those days, you know, it's some of the bosses that 
you know, I just thought, hmm, that's behavior I never want to catch myself doing. <laughs> so no names mentioned, but were there things that you remember that were good or bad about some of those early years when you had bosses and, and was exhibiting their behavior or well, observing their behavior? Each boss kind of would give you, I'll call it snippets that would help right. you throughout right. your career that I'm smart enough to know. I just would repeat to others because they worked for me. And I would say, you know, the first one is after others had told me I was a good communicator, I probably fell into a pattern of over communicating. I'm telling them <laughs> the details. And a few bosses would say, you know, while we appreciate that insight, you're here because we trust you. So right, when we right. ask you, you know, the 10 second question, a five second answer is good instead of a two minute answer. Right. Interesting. Good. good. The others um, would talk about, you know, when we were interacting with clients, we smiled yeah, about you were given two ears and one mouth, and sometimes you need to use them in that proportion. <laughs> That's a because good real business oftentimes is about listening more than right. it is about transmitting, if sure. that makes enough sure. sense. Well, that's biblical, too, if you think about the book of James, right? Right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, slow those, to speak, fast right. to listen, <laughs> slow to anger. <laughs> well, when I say that line to others, sometimes I say, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Sometimes that's, that's right. a good idea to use it in that proportion. That's right. That's I think right. some of the others, I there were also some lessons that I tried to not duplicate. I mean, I had sure. a couple of bosses that would uh, show temper or aggression or uh, potentially when somebody made an error, uh, literally almost embarrass them in a, a, um, uh, a public forum. Mm. I guess that that registered so much for me yeah. Yeah. as you sit there on the side and watch them. That's not something that is the right way to empower employees to go forward. So praise the public, criticize in private. Right. Or even uh, you can criticize, but maybe mentor is a better right. way to look right. at it because yes. right. oftentimes um, it's they haven't been empowered right. or positioned or mentored enough to understand that there is a better way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally get that. So you've been with Frontier Technology a number of years. I, I don't yep. believe that was the startup, correct? You, you had right. a couple of skips and, before that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just the two. So I, I, right. when I came back to Ohio, I did 10 years with a, what was called a minority owned firm that, mm -hmm. that grew quite a bit. And then um, I spent the last 25 years with, or 24 point something um, with Frontier. Yeah. Now yeah. they were, a, were they a startup at the time when you came in or were you one of the founders? What was your- Our founder is amazing, amazing mm -hmm. man. And he had started it in 85. I joined him in 94. And I think it was up to about 10 to 12 people when I came. Definitely in those early years as it relates to the uh, the, the beginning of the company. And, and did you come in in an engineering capacity? What was some of the first jobs you had there? Well, because I had managed uh, a pretty significant group on the former my, uh, small business I would say manage, but again, when you're a 10 to 15 person company, that's just, you know, a handful of people working for you. But sure. ultimately it was, I'll call it a leadership role of, I think they called it the director who, right. you know, rep the people reported into you interacted with the clients and you just made sure the business was running as effective as you could. So when you joined, did you have any, you know, goals or any, you know, idea that you might be running the place someday? The founder was one of those guys that I get an incredible amount of insight even today. Is he still involved in the business? Or she? He is not. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, okay. he uh, passed away a few years ago, okay. but he uh, immediately gave me stock ownership of mm. a portion of the company Nice, and, and just kind of said, it's the people that make it worthwhile. And one of his lines is, I'd much rather own a smaller piece of a bigger pie than, uh, uh, you know, yeah. the entire thing of a very small aspect. So Smart. share it with the people that make a difference to you. And um, so I guess I always envisioned that it could, it could evolve could that way. Right. Right. Um, and just hope that hard work would get us there. Yeah. So hard work obviously is a, a cornerstone to, to getting to that corner office. How was, Christ involved, you know, what, um, how did your kind of uh, beliefs play out as your career began to, you know, light up and, and you continued in progressing to lead, eventually lead Frontier Technology? You know, I, I'm blessed because um, the founder really was such a strong Christian. He was a believer. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And he made it clear each and every day and kind of empowered us. I, there's, you know, in, in other interactions with the community, I've never met a founder, CEO, et cetera, 
that gave away half of his ownership of the corporation mm. to the charitable cause of the church and other things. Wow. And so each and every day felt like through his guidance, he kept saying, Ron, when is enough enough? Let's just make this work for other people. And he didn't just verbalize it. He lived it each and every day. And we wow. knew we were working for an orphanage in South Africa and for the church mm. and other things. So when you have that kind of a mentor, it's very, very easy to kind of factor that in. In, in the business we're in, um, obviously with the federal government and other aspects, there's a certain part of your decision making can't be influenced um, in a negative light. But it certainly makes up who you are, and that tends to make a, uh, a lot of the decisions as we go forward. Was your faith walk pretty strong before you joined Frontier? It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And was that one of the things that attracted you to the company? Did you know that uh, the CEO and founder uh, was a believer? I, I had heard it, but I mm-hmm. didn't really understand it at the level that I came to appreciate as yeah. I got to know him more and more and more. And it sounds like you were evaluated for your skills first, right? right. Your qualifications yes. for the job. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, what a what a terrific mentor. And and that's something that did, did he really permeate that throughout the whole organization? Everybody knew that, you know, that was a very important part to him, I, I, I suppose. Right. Particularly giving all the sounds like many different charitable contributions he made over the years. Right. And it, it, it's still a part of the company yeah. today that, that the concept of it is who individuals are and it, right. it, it aligns with some of our priorities. But in this company, we have a diverse group of faith sure. and non-faith yeah. and other aspects of it. And it's a great combination because um, we're empowered to do a lot of things in part because of who we are today, but also a, a very strong connection to his legacy. Uh, awesome. And and still privately owned. Um, is it all employee owned now or is there a private equity involved? Uh-huh. No, yeah. it's all employee owned. He, you know, he, that concept that I told you when he brought me in, we kind of consistently did that through the years as other people came on board that were going to make a difference for us. So today, I think uh, there's roughly 55 owners of the company oh, and they're all employees. Are you structured as an ESOP or is it just the stock ownership is spread? Just the stock the ownership. Yeah. We looked at ESOP and it was pretty complex and yeah. decided for legal. Yeah. yeah, some mm-hmm. of the disadvantages, we decided not to yeah. go that path. Yeah. We've got a number of clients that are based that way and some work and some don't. You know, it, it is something that has to be structured in the right style. Um, so speaking about style, tell, tell me a little bit about how your leadership style has evolved over the time uh, that you've, you've certainly been at Frontier for the last uh, quarter of a century. You know, it, it probably started off with engineering and engineering is all of the decomposition of the data and, you know, let's go into the details, et cetera. And right. uh, I jokingly at this point in my career, I hope to be fired as CEO and I'd like to have the job of what I call CCO, <laughs> which is chief cultural officer. Right, right. Because our role is really just to empower the employees to do amazing things. Yeah. And if we can get out of the way, and, and let that happen and by setting up the right culture, the right infrastructure they need to be successful um, and truly empower them. I think the company um, explodes beyond what the industry averages are. And so uh, today, I think uh, I capture it, not only trying to capture it in a strategic plan and everything else, but I describe the company as um, the four C's. And the four C's are our core values, commitment, compassion, and charity. Mm. And the charity is about the loving thy neighbor aspect of it. And so I want our group to have that passion. How honored are we that we not only get through a defense contract culture, that we get to support the war fighters and the vets and everything else along those lines, but that we can do it not only on our day-to-day work activities, but also in our passion kind of outside the work hours. Right. So Fantastic. I spent a lot of time talking about that vision and that culture for the employees and a little less time on the numbers and the detailed aspects of day-to-day day-to-day. operations. Yeah. 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 Well, that's uh, that's certainly the case. Most of the CEOs we've interviewed, you know, they do put a very, very high importance on culture. What's unusual or, or perhaps unique about Frontier's culture, Ron? I would say, you know, if you go out the glass door and other things, and the... Um, the passion that comes from Levon or pieces of it from my childhood or others as we've placed that out. Because the one problem that we did face a few years ago is he unexpectedly passed away. And when he did... And that's Levon as a founder, 
correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he, he, again, he had this, we didn't have the best exit strategy for him. So his concept was, hey, minimize the profits for a little bit and spend a lot of money out of the profits and buy key man life insurance. Okay. And then hmm. that way, if anything ever happens, the company will have the money to buy charity that that he had given it away to and his estate, right. um, buy them out. And then uh, the rest of the employees that used to own maybe 10% of the company, unfortunately overnight uh, owned 100%. And I wow. say unfortunately, because we certainly wish, wished he was here today. Sure. But what a gift yeah. of an owner to give to those employees that helped wow. empower him. And so we, we try to still have that culture today. That's awesome. Well, he knew he couldn't take it with him. That's true. <laughs> and it well, is about giving it away. Absolutely right. Fantastic. Yep. So what what do you look for, Ron, when you're making bets on the people you invest in and hire? You know, the biggest thing is understanding their passions. Um, mm-hmm. In this industry, mm-hmm. that there's there's got to be a certain level of uh, security clearances and technical or business background and other things. But there's waves of people that can come and go in the industry. And what we're looking for is somebody that's going to stay with us. And to do that, we really want them to understand our culture um, and make sure that they're comfortable with it. Because sometimes we hold ourselves to a different level of accountability than I think what others in the industry might do. I'm sure you get involved in some interviewing and hiring. I'm sure certainly for your direct reports, but maybe one or two levels down. You know, if you only had a few minutes to interview someone that maybe was a, a direct hire of a direct report, um, you know, what would you ask them? What, what kind of interview questions would you would you put them to if you had a short period of time? I kind of start them off in a way that they don't expect. Mm. I, I I will initially start with, hey, don't look at this as an interview where I sit here and decide whether this is a good fit or not. I I would rather spend this time trying to convince you it's not the right fit for you. Mm. Um, Because I want them to understand that small business that's growing at what some call hyper levels, there's a bunch of challenges that come up from that. And, And because of that, Sometimes, you know, you think of us as a bigger company, but we haven't necessarily had the time to build the infrastructure and other things. So when you come here, you are going to help solve problems. And sometimes, you know, the the easy answer isn't going to be handed to you. Mm. And if that's a problem for you, um, our biggest thing is we're investing in you. And so we want you to understand those challenges because when you decide to come here, we don't want you to get here and be surprised by anything mm. um, because that's when people, you know, I call it aren't engaged or haven't have unfulfilled expectations. And sometimes in interview sessions, it becomes a sales pitch on both sides. Right, right. And sometimes the heart is hidden from the sales pitch. Yeah. And um, I try to, in my you know, I'll call it five minutes of interview, kind of say, are you sure this is the kind of place mm-hmm. that you'd enjoy? Um, mm. what, what, how do you compare this to places that maybe you have left? And, and are there any things in those that we might have here, et cetera? Because I think of me in an interview as an advocate for them, trying to help them make an informed decision. That's great. That's great. So it's passion, but it's also, it sounds like problem solving abilities, right? It and, is. Yeah. And making sure that they're certain about this is a place they want to work. Do you, do you delegate a lot? I mean, it sounds like you've, you've did that early on in your career, but is it kind of a culture where people are expected to make mistakes uh, and try to figure things out? You know, I, I my favorite TV show is Shark Tank. <laughs> and, and so um, in, in that case, I, I think uh, making a mistake is just uh, kind of a, a research one, effort to find out what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're not penalized for that in this culture. It's actually appreciated so that we move on to the next component and try something different. Right. Fantastic. Well, Ron, we're just about out of time and I want to thank you so much. This has been a great interview, but we always have one last question. We ask all the CEOs and, you know, what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone that is listening today and maybe has their eyes on their corner office, but maybe is a decade or so behind you? Well, I mean, we've talked a lot about the passion. I I think that's um, probably a primary thought that from a career perspective, you have to have. And and that is not only about uh, the passion for what customers you're serving, but the corporation that you're working for and the passion that that corporation has in other areas that hopefully align with you. As I mentor others, I, I, uh, I have a wall in my office that um, 
is everything from the kids to the grandchild to mm. everything else. And I try to explain to them that in, in my life, uh, I would claim that my business profession, which is what we're here talking about, is the fourth priority for me. Mm. And that they really need to have an understanding of what their priorities are. And I usually have them face the wall of my family um, to make it clear of what's really ultimately important. Because mm. I hope for their sake, um, mentoring wise, that that they go through that same analysis. I was so blessed to have a, a government customer 15 years ago when I sat down and started talking to him about the engineering solution that we could provide stop me and uh, say, hey, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I kind of like what you're talking about, but can I ask you a quick question? And I said, sure. And he said, uh, what are your life priorities? Wow. And when I kind of did the hesitation, he rattled his off one, two, three, four. That meeting had a long-term impact oh, to me. I still admire him great. a great deal. Yeah. And I would hope that others that are looking for the corner office kind of make sure they can answer that question as yeah. well. Yeah. And then um, my my last one, because it's true, is the other thing I would um, think was part of my success that I hope for everybody is what I call marrying up. Explain that one. <laughs> my, my my wife is the better half, if you know <laughs> okay, what I mean. Okay, got so, it, got she, it. She, I uh, identify with that as well. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be inspired by her dad and others, right. but um, it's awfully nice to be inspired by somebody you're with each and every day. Fantastic. Well, Ron Schroeder, CEO and Chairman of Frontier Technology, thank you so very much for sharing your journey into the corner office. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.go4roy.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. 